Welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining this uh, webinar about uh, cryptography. Uh, this webinar is an introduction to a microchip university course uh, on this subject. Um, the link uh, we will paste it in the chat box and we will show it uh, in between uh, clips. Uh, my name is Clemens Valens. I'm from Elector and I will be co presenting this with uh, Dan Yuvari from Microchip. Dan is the one who put this class together and so he knows everything about our subject. Uh, so, uh, hi, Dan. Uh, how are you today? Great. Thanks for having me. So, so, I hear you are in New York and the weather is not so good. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I'm in New York. Uh, I love it here, except when the weather goes bad. <laughs> um, uh, we also have Dino Varta from Kachip with us. Uh, last time I talked to him, he was in Austria. Uh, hi, Dino. Can you tell us in a few words what your role is? Uh, if you're... Yes. Oh, we cannot hear you if you are talking. Okay. Hello, Clemens. Ah, yes, there he is. Hi, Dan. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Elector Webinar. You are going to find out a lot of very interesting things, like myself. So I'm an ESC engineer from uh, um, Microchip Electronics. Uh, in Eastern Europe site. So hello from Vienna, Austria. Uh, and uh, like uh, yourself, uh, Clemens, and uh, everybody who are going to join uh, today's webinar, I'm going to learn a lot of things from Dan. So thank you for the invitation. And please um, be aware. So after uh, this webinar, you feel free. You can feel free to, to send uh, your questions. I am uh, more than glad to follow up. Thank you. Yes, if technical questions uh, go to you, huh? Everything will, you, you want to know <laughs> on this subject, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah, we will paste your uh, email uh, in the chat box also, so then people Perfect. have it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Like I said, this webinar is uh, divided into uh, blocks. Uh, it give you the idea is to give you an idea of the complete class. Uh, after each block, um, there is room for questions. So if um, in a block something is not clear, you can uh, type a question in the chat box and we will try to answer it uh, in between. If not, we will continue simply with the second or the following block. Uh, all these blocks are not more or less self-contained, but the, there may be uh, some jumps in knowledge between blocks. So uh, if you do not understand everything that is normal you for that, you should follow the complete, uh, do the complete class. Um, like I said, you're not trying, to, uh, not to supposed to uh, learn and write down and take notes while we present this. This is an introduction. You should take the real class when you have the time for it, uh, as it takes more than uh, one hour. It, uh, I did it and it takes about two hours. Um, and when you do the class, when you take the class, you get a certificate afterwards. Um, at the end of the webinar, of this webinar, you can ask questions and you do that in, by typing in the chat box in the right lower corner. Well, at least that is where it is on my uh, screen. Uh, okay, so um, I think we can start. And I can already say the download the slides. Well, it's not a slide, it's a video, but the video will be uh, recorded. We are recording this webinar and the video will be posted on YouTube afterwards. Okay, so here we go. All animators, please mute your microphone. Welcome to eMasters and thank you for your interest in our cryptography primer. My name is Dan Yuvari. I am the global education leader within the security function group here at Microchip. Let's talk about this class for a moment. This is a vendor agnostic presentation of the fundamentals of cryptography. The information you gain here is industry standard in nature and will be valuable no matter what vendor's products you eventually use. The target audiences are those without any prior knowledge of cryptography or those whose knowledge is so rusty they need a refresher on the basics. This presentation covers practical applications only. Unfortunately, a mathematical analysis of the functions highlighted in this class would not be trivial. It would require a separate class requiring substantial math prerequisites and a lot more time. The good news is there is plenty of resources on the web for this. We have included some of our favorite links, but encourage you to explore for more. 
I promised you this was a vendor agnostic presentation on cryptography, and I meant it. But it's important to know the credentials of the source of your newfound knowledge. We are arguably the leader in embedded security. Embedded security is that security which resides on the PCB and establishes the immutable identity of the embedded device. We introduced Keylock back in the mid-1980s, which quickly became the de facto standard in the automotive industry. In the late 1990s, IBM asked us to create a security ASIC for notebook computers to be sold to the United States government. The notebooks needed to remain secure if they were ever lost or stolen. A couple of years later, IBM, along with Hewlett Packard, Compaq, and a few others, formed a standards group called the Trusted Computing Platform Alliance, or TCPA for short. Their first standard was the Trusted Platform Module, or TPM. It was based on our ASIC. The TCPA eventually became the Trusted Computer Group of today, which carries the same mission. Microchip has never stopped leading. We have consistently innovated throughout the years. Recently, we had enormous impact on the market with two innovations. We revolutionized the method to secure onboarding used by the prominent cloud services. And we introduced the first truly low volume, cost-effective provisioning service to the market, making embedded security affordable in the lowest cost devices. And we continue this tradition, to, tradition of innovation and invention by leading the charge in helping communities to lock down vulnerable infrastructures like power, communications, and transportation. I hope that wasn't too much of a plug for Microchip. The point is, you couldn't be receiving this material from a better source. Although everyone is becoming increasingly aware of the need for security, too few realize the full risk they face. Many, including many of us in the semiconductor industry, don't fully understand how much is at risk for our clients. It is important all OEMs understand the risks of poor security to avoid the significant liabilities that lay in wait for those who don't. Remember that everyone touched by your system expects their securities will be protected. Designers want to protect their IP and recurring revenue streams, fight cloning, control the number of genuine units built, and control ch supply chain and warranty costs. But more than anything else, they need to protect their brand. Make sure your system protects your client's privacy and personal information too. In this day and age, this is assumed by any end user. If your ecosystem includes service providers, make absolutely sure their value is also protected as well. When developing any secure solution, all of these things need to be considered. All who touch the product need to be protected. Protecting anyone but missing just one party will put your brand in just as much jeopardy as if you did absolutely nothing at all. Achieving security is designing in a state of mind as much as it is an application of cryptographic algorithms. Knowledge. Typically, we reuse knowledge from prior experience in our next projects. Not so with cryptography. Cryptography is not something engineers casually pick up along the way. Engineers comfortable with cryptography have deliberately studied it, and relatively few engineers are comfortable with cryptography. This is one reason we developed this class, a securable program space. It is highly desirable for any microcontroller or microprocessor you select to have a securable boot area. This is an unchangeable, inimmutable portion of firmware that can be considered known genuine. We use it to authenticate the rest of the code before executing it a hardware-enforced, persistent, secure area. Most people understand that secrets and keys need to be protected by hardware security, but few realize the critical crypto primitives that use those keys and secrets need protection as well. Authentication, integrity checks, key spawning, and key exchange, to name just a few, need to be protected in a persistent, secure environment. If these critical crypto primitives resided in a vulnerable space, a hacker could compromise them so that they could authenticate anything. They wouldn't need your keys. They could bypass them completely. A well-planned ecosystem and infrastructure. 
a large portion of any conversation we have with our clients revolves around the ecosystem and infrastructure. I can't say this enough. No security is absolute. Given enough time, energy, and money, anything can be hacked. So great care must be taken that no single corrupted device will compromise your entire ecosystem. Let's talk about security in terms we hear regularly. Cybersecurity, embedded security, and physical security. They must work in concert together to create overall security. Cybersecurity is the combination of people, processes, and advanced software that protects entire ecosystems. It's usually complex, expensive, and needs frequent updates. Embedded security is hardware-enforced security at the PCB level, offering persistent security for keys and critical crypto primitives. It typically is what creates the unique identity of a device upon which all authentication and integrity checks are based. Physical security are the measures taken to physically restrict access to a device and its information. Overall security is the application of all of the above. Embedded security is the foundation upon which good cybersecurity rests. Cybersecurity, if not anchored to the hardware via embedded security, cannot be nearly as effective as it could be. Physical security simply slows down adversaries. It makes them conspicuous if they try to hack something in a public space. It does little if the adversary has physical possession of the device. And while you're designing security into your project from the beginning, never forget the primary reason you're doing it. We can talk about what we protect and how we protect it. We can talk about how an insecure device is bad for society as a whole, as it is destructive to our connected world and all that. But the primary reason we implement robust security is for the enhancement and the protection of your organization's reputation and brands. Without that, nobody has a job and no secure devices are being made. So that is the primary thing we're all protecting. Okay, so this was the end of the second block. I couldn't find the pause button at the, after the first block, and I don't think there are many questions after the first block. Uh, after seeing this, I was quite surprised uh, about the, the primary reason to, to apply uh, security, as you are saying, that it's to protect your brand. Uh, so actually, it's kind of a, it's a part of the quality of the product you make as a company, right? Yeah, I mean the uh, the thing is, if your uh, if your device is compromised and your brand suffers, you're out of business. So everything is lost. Um, it's great to protect society. It's great to protect all these things, and those are all priorities. But if your brand is lost and your company goes down and closes, you don't have a chance to protect society anymore. You don't have a chance to do any of the good things that security can bring. So the first thing you have to do is protect your company. And that's where that comes from. Yeah, okay. okay. And another question, but that's a, a minor question. You mentioned the Y uh, acronym, but you explained the W and the H, but what does the Y stand for? Uh, it wasn't an acronym, it was just the Y. It's just the Y, okay. yeah, <laughs> it, sorry. <laughs> okay. And I have a question to Dino. I thought I had your email in my notes, but I can't find it. If you can paste it in the chat box, please, uh, then uh, people can contact you uh, if they have any questions. Let me check. I see something pop up here. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no questions, then we can continue with the next block. Mute. CAA is a common memory mnemonic to remember confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. And it works because CIA makes one think of Central Intelligence Agency, and Central Intelligence Agency makes one think of security. I'm not such a big fan of it. I actually would like to see this as A, I, and sometimes C, and let me get into that. There is a common misconception, uh, and I believe it's because the C uh, for confidentiality comes first in CIA, and this might lead newcomers to, a, to this common misconception. Whenever security is mentioned, encryption is often the first thing that comes to their mind, but it shouldn't be. 
They use encryption as authentication. For example, they believe if one node in a network encrypts a message to another network node and that node can decrypt it, everything must be okay. It's not okay. That is a misuse of encryption and leaves open a number of potential vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, the scope of those attacks on encryption are well beyond the scope of this class, but we'll cover the nature and uses of authentication in this class. Let's go over the priority of cryptographic functions. Whenever security is mentioned, encryption is often the first thing that comes to mind, but again, it should not be. Cryptographic functions in order of priority are authentication, establish the other communicator is genuine. In practical applications of cryptography, as in most cases in life, really, we first authenticate the identity of the entity we're talking to. Don't you want to know who you're talking to? Then we ensure the integrity of the messages. We need to confirm the messages arrive in exactly the same condition as they were sent. This too is like our natural world. Don't you want to hear people clearly and, clear and correctly? Finally, we make the message confidential by obfuscating it in some way, but only if the payload has value. Once again, our analogy to our real world is striking. If we're sharing a secret with a person, we're, won't we lower our voices? Won't we speak indirectly or maybe even we'll obfuscate what we're trying to say, and speak in code so that it's difficult for others to understand what we're trying to say? Now, if what we're saying to the other person has no value, we don't do any of that. We don't bother. True security is most often attained by applying only the first two, authentication and integrity. Confidentiality is totally optional. If you firmly establish the identity of the sender and you can be assured of the integrity of the messages, does it really matter if the message can be read or not? That completely depends on the value of the message, right? Think about a networked lighting system. If the fixture can trust a message came from its controller and nowhere else, and if the fixture can verify the integrity of that message, does it matter if the actual command was in the clear? Remember, the fixture won't respond to any command unless it first authenticates it came from its controller and verifies the integrity of the message. In that case, do we really need to encrypt the message? Maybe, maybe not. It's optional. It depends on whether the message payload is valuable or compromises security in some way. Encryption is actually the least important element of security in many situations. Yeah, I'd like to uh, add one thing to this. Uh, often people uh, challenge the CIA, uh, the uh, the A for authentication. Um, you have to realize I'm an old guy. <laughs> and um, um, so I, I've been involved with cryptography for, for, for many years, if not dec decades. And uh, the, um, the thing is, uh, cybersecurity came on board um, around in the 1990s. But cryptography has been around for literally thousands of years. And when I first got involved with cryptography, CIA was uh, confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. Uh, and then when cybersecurity came on board in the 1990s, they changed all the, the A to availability. And as cybersecurity becomes more and more prevalent um, and more and more of an umbrella term to, to cover everything, because there used to be, um, you know, there used to be embedded, there used to be cryptography and then physical security. And now that you have uh, cybersecurity, embedded security, and physical security, and cybersecurity is becoming an umbrella term that covers everything. Uh, so now the A is really more of a, a term that means availability. But in this context, I'm talking about uh, embedded security and cryptography. So we use the A as uh, as uh, authentication. Okay. Yeah, I found this uh, this clip quite uh, interesting because it actually you have clearly two types. Eh? You have the communication so you the you want to be sure that the messages are okay and there is encryption which is completely unrelated actually that's only to protect the content of something that's so right i think that's important to um, keep in mind um what you might know if you take the course you might want to know if you take the class um in between these clips 
uh, sometimes there are uh, multiple choice questions popping up and you have to answer these before you can continue. And um, sometimes these questions are uh, uh, concerned uh, with the small detail that you saw in the clip. So you have to pay attention and just don't watch them and then uh, forget about it. Pay attention. Okay, I don't see questions, so we can continue with the video. So what is a hash function? We're finally getting into the fundamental building blocks of cryptography. Hash functions take input data of varying size, and they output one fixed-sized value to represent it. You'll hear the output referred to by many names but digest is probably the most popular. A hash function is used in a variety of ways in normal computing, meaning non-cryptographic computing. I'm sure most of you are familiar with a hash table. This is a way of using the digest of some data to address that data. When two sets of data have the same digest, it's called a collision. Computing has various ways of dealing with collisions, but cryptography cannot tolerate collisions. In cryptography, we opt for stronger algorithms and longer bit lengths to avoid collisions. Hash functions used in cryptography need to uniquely identify files. One shouldn't have two files with the same identity in cryptography. In cryptography, we need the hash digest of a file to be a unique fingerprint of that file. So let's go over the cryptographic hash function. A hash function is also known as a compression function, by the way. A hash transforms any data of any size into one unique output of fixed length. This unique output is often analogized as a fingerprint of that data. The transform is one way, meaning it's infeasible to reverse it. A CRC is a, is a hash that everybody knows about, but it's weak, far too weak for cryptography. But if you're familiar with CRC, you realize if you're given a CRC of a file, there's no way you're going to be able to reproduce that file from the CRC, right? It's the same thing with a cryptographic hash, only the, the cryptographic hash will never have the same hash for two different files. SHA-256 of the SHA-2 family is an example of a strong crypto hash with a fixed length of 256 bits. The length is determined by the hash function selected. So a hash 224 would have 224 bits. The characteristics of a strong crypto hash is it's easy to compute the output, which is called a digest or message digest as we went, already went over. It's infeasible to modify a message without changing the digest. And by the way, that change will be profound. A good crypto hash will have what, what they call a cascade feature or avalanche feature, where a single bit change in the file will cause a radical change in the output digest. It's also infeasible to find different messages with the same digest. Hash functions have many uses, but for this training, we will focus on its uses to uniquely identify data and to confirm two or more entities possess identical data, such as the same file or the same key. So let's go over exactly how a hash, crypto hash, works. So again, a hash is known as a compression algorithm. And the block diagram for your typical compression algorithm is there on the right. You start off with the uh, initialization state of the, of the uh, crypto hash. And you also start off with a message consisting of n minus 1 inputs. And the message is going to be sliced into pieces of a particular size. So remember, we were using a SHA-256 as the example. So whatever whatever me this message is, we're going to slice this message into uh, slices of 256 bits, 32 bytes each. And the way this works is we, we take the first slice and that first input is hashed with the initialization state, resulting in state zero or sub-zero. Then we take our next slice and that gets hashed with the now existing state sub zero becomes state sub one. And we take the next slice and that gets hashed with state sub one and becomes state sub two and so on and so forth until we take our final input, which gets 
uh, hashed with that last state. And since we have no more inputs, this becomes our final digest. We just take the last state and that becomes our final digest. Now, if that final message slice is not long enough, in other words, if it, if it does not consist of a full 256 bits for this particular algorithm, uh, using uh, SHA-256 as the example, uh, we need to pad it. We need to add extra bit to it to, to make it the full size uh, and then send it through. And if we needed to do that, and if we were sending this information to somebody else, of course, we would also have to send that information. We'd have to say, hey, uh, if we pad uh, the last byte with anything, it's going to be padded with, you know, this information. Okay, the hash function, very important. I think you have to remember the word to digest. It will come, uh, it's used a lot in this course. Um, anything to add to this, Dan? Uh, not unless there's any questions. That's pretty much the way it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, like I said in the beginning, um, if you take this class and you go all the way, you end up with a certificate. You can see mine in the left uh, bottom corner proven that I uh, took this class and I'm so almost a security expert by now. All right, there, there is a question. It says, uh, does it make a difference if you use the same value for padding? Uh, no, as long as, as, long as the, um, the end user knows what you're using, that's, that, that should be fine uh, because they have to um, uh, remember that they, you're sending um, the, the digest is an integrity check of the message. So you're sending the message to them. Like say you're gonna send a, um, I don't know, the Magna Carta to somebody and you wanna make sure that, uh, and they, you wanna make sure that they can authenticate um, that they got the message uh, completely the way you sent it. So you're gonna send a digest of the Magna Carta and then say, uh, the Magna Carta doesn't um, divide up evenly into 256 bits. You have to let them know what you padded that last input as, because they have to take that entire file on their side. They need to hash it, and then they're going to do a binary compare between the digest that you sent and the digest that they created. So they need to know what that padding is. That's it. So it could be anything. There's a follow-up question. What does this uh, all have to do with uh, crypto uh, the cryptography primer? Uh, hashing is uh, a, a fundamental in both symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Uh, hashing is um, uh, you know a, a, a basic for a basic for a fundamental for uh, integrity checks. it's it's the way you uh, one of the ways you would create a message authentication code. Uh, which is actually explained in the, not here, but in the uh, crypto primer. Uh, it's also a fundamental of how uh, you would create um, a signature of something. So if you were going to send a message and you were going to create a, an, a, an asymmetric signature of something, you would first hash that message and then you would sign the digest. So yeah, it's, uh, it's very important. It's one of the yes. most important things. Okay. Thank you. Um so let's continue with the next. Uh... Let's talk about confidentiality now. In the context of information security, confidentiality means protecting information from being accessed by unauthorized parties. There are many ways we can keep valuable information confidential. We can prevent unauthorized access to the system containing it. But how do we protect that information while in transit? For this, we use encryption. Encryption has a very long history dating back thousands of years. Most texts skip over the earliest forms because they are intertwined with the development of writing itself and instead begin with what's called the Caesar cipher, an early but clear and easy to understand method of encrypting messages. It's rather simple. We use the alphabet, for the language the message is written in as the base and shift the letters a number of places to the right or left. Here's an example of a three-place shift-right Caesar cipher applied to the word hat. The result is KDW.
If you can forgive my rather extreme analogy reach, we can think of the alphabet as the cipher algorithm to apply to the message and the number three as the key to use with that algorithm. What are keys? And more importantly, what are session keys? Session keys are used with a cipher to obfuscate messages and data. To encrypt today, we use a modern cipher, which needs keys. A modern cipher is a complex cryptographic math function, which uses a unique key to obfuscate input, which we call plain text, into unreadable output, which we call cipher text. There are many types of ciphers, and you've heard probably many of these. AES, DES. We are for another presentation which covers ciphers and their modes in some detail. If you're interested in this, please ask for it. A critical mass of ciphertext with the same key presents a risk. It's called key exhaustion. Therefore, temporary keys are used and changed as required to thwart these vulnerabilities, hence the term session keys. A session can be, can be of any length of time. A session could be every message transmission, or it could be a full day or a full week of transmissions. It all really depends on how much data you're, be, you're sending how much plain text you're turning into ciphertext. You don't want to convert too much ciphertext to the same key, because if you do that, then you run into this vulnerability. A single transmission could even consist of multiple sessions. In the military or in the financial world, uh, sometimes transmissions are have keys rotated every 100 milliseconds while the transmission is ongoing. Symmetric cryptography for session keys. So here we have an example of how we're going to create a session key using symmetric cryptography. Alice wants to send Bob a secret message. Alice and Bob previously have shared identical secret keys. And of course, they know and trust each other. So Alice sends a new random challenge. This is not the same random challenge that Alice used when she first authenticated with Bob. Keep that in mind, please. Remember, Alice and Bob first authenticated each other. Then now this is a new uh, a new function that they're doing. So Alice sends a new random challenge. And then Bob takes this random challenge and he sends it through the hash function. And so does Alice. And now the, the output is referred to as a session key because they're about to use this with a cipher. They don't send this back and forth to each other. They just keep it close. They do not share it with anyone. And then they use this with a cipher algorithm and Alice turns plain text into cipher text, and Bob turns that cipher text into plain text. Okay, there we saw the hash function uh, coming into action. Yep, once again. So there are a few um, other questions that I guess we could just run back to real quick about um, is there, um, is it possible to crack the SHA-256 algorithm? Uh, currently, the SHA-256 algorithm is considered secure. So nobody's uh, shown how to do that now yet. Um, and um, someone says, uh, massively parallel computing and e.g. quantum computer. Uh, so quantum computing has been, uh, will uh, completely destroy PKI, public key infrastructure, asymmetric cryptography. Asymmetric, asymmetric cryptography, as we know it today, will be uh, utterly blown away by quantum computing. Not so with uh, symmetric cryptography. Uh, quantum computing, uh, so far we believe quantum computing will have a, uh, an impact on symmetric cryptography, that it will reduce the uh, um, effective security by uh, n divided by two. So right now, if you have a key length of uh, 128 bits, that would be uh, 2 to the 128. Uh, and right now, today, the effective security is 2 to the 128. Uh, but after quantum computing hits, uh, the effective uh, security of that key will not be 2 to the 128. It will be 2 to the n divided by 2. So it would be 2 to the 64. And 2 to the 64 today is not secure. 2 to the 128 is. So uh, really, 2 to the 256 today uh, is will is considered uh, to be secure even when quantum computing hits. So SHA-256 is uh, is considered to be se secure even after quantum computing comes. So, okay. But when will quantum computing come? Ah, 
that's a good question. That's, that's another question. Yeah, uh, it, it could be. Yeah, there's you, you. If you look that up, there's there's experts in the field that's that will give you anywhere from next year to twenty years from now. I and I don't ask me. I have no idea. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, let's continue with the, the next. What if Alice and Bob don't know each other? We've only considered the case of Alice and Bob knowing and trusting each other. But if Alice and Bob are strangers, they must establish a chain of trust in which they share a common trusted authority. This trusted authority is known as a trust anchor or a root of trust. This trusted authority will vouch for Alice to Bob and will also vouch for Bob to Alice. Certificates are used to carry the authority's assurance that these entities are genuine. The authority is typically the OEM in the embedded space, but it can be a certificate authority like Semantic, GoDaddy, DigiCert, etc. How are certificates used to establish trust? Um, I like to explain this in using this cartoon. It, over the years, this has become the easiest way to explain it. Let's assume that Bob's mom and Alice know and trust each other, but Alice and Bob have never met and they don't know if they can trust each other. So Bob's mom happens to know that Alice will bump it to Bob later today. And she says, Alice, can you please give my son a message for me? So Alice is willing, and she says, sure, I can give him the message, but how will he know the message came from you? He doesn't know me. Bob's mom says, no problem. Give him this certificate of message authenticity. And once he reads this certificate, he'll realize the message came from me, nobody else but me, and everything will be fine. So Alice bumps into Bob and says, hi, Bob, I have a message from your mom. Bob, being from New York, says, who the heck are you, and what have you done with my mom? And Alice right away says, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, here's the certificate of message authenticity that your mom gave me. This message really is from your mom. Bob reads that and says, oh, thank you. It's so good to hear from my mom. So now this is a, an example of message authentication. But you could imagine that Bob's mom could have given Alice a certificate directing Bob to trust whatever Alice says from now on, um, essentially making the introduction and removing herself. And this would be a way to transfer authority. And that's the way things are done um, sometimes, like say when a lighting control company or a network lighting company installs a network lighting system into a campus. They will uh, install the, the system and then they will send a certificate through the system to tell network to listen to the local server on campus rather than the server back at the OEM. And that will transfer the authority that way. So let's take a look and see what's inside of this certificate. Certificates have a lot of information. They have the version, and the serial number, the algorithm IDs. Why algorithm IDs? Well, if you have to interoperate with other vendors' products, how do they know what algorithms you use? How do they know you're using SHA-2 rather than SHA-1 or SHA-3? Or how do they know you're using uh, AES-128 or AES-256? Well, they'll know inside the certificate. You told them. Who the issue, also the issuer date, validity, the certificate is not valid before a particular time or not after a particular time. The most important things inside of this certificate are the subject public key and the digital signature. Really, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the subject public key to be um, assured by the authority uh, who, pr who provides their digital signature. Now, in the Bob's mom and Alice case, Alice gave Bob's mom this certificate. She gave it to, her, to uh, Bob's mom in the form of a certificate signing request, but, uh, but Alice basically put this together and installed her subject public key. Alice is the subject. And then Bob's mom signed it and it provided the digital signature. And what she did is she hashed the entire document and then signed the resultant digest. So she didn't just sign the subject public key, she signed the entire digest of the document, thereby assuring the contents of the entire document. So Alice gave Bob's mom this document, requested it, she sign it in a CSR, a certificate signing request, and then Bob's mom hashed the document, 
including Alice's public key, and then signed the resulting digest, thereby assuring the entire information. Right. That's how it works in the web-based world. It works a little differently in the uh, embedded world. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about degenerate certificates. These are not certificates that grew up badly and, and started smoking cigarettes on street corners. These are just uh, certificates that aren't like other certificates. Uh, in the embedded space, we often only need to know the public key is genuine. Uh, authenticating the entire certificate, then extracting the public key takes time, power, and can present vulnerabilities depending on where the contents are worked on, right? So the simplest form of a degenerate certificate is a public key with an authority signature of it. Or one could have a complete certificate, but only the public key is authenticated by a signature. Or maybe only a few elements of the certificate uh, are authenticated. Maybe validity dates are very important, or maybe the serial number is very important, or something, uh, but uh, maybe something other than just the, the public key, but not the entire certificate. So basically, a degenerate certificate is that only elements uh, of, a, of, a, of a full certificate would be authenticated. Degenerate certificates make it easier and more efficient for low-powered embedded devices to authenticate the data they need. I should mention a certificate thumbprint is just the hash digest of a certificate. You'll hear this term every now and again. Please don't confuse it with a degenerate certificate. It's used to generate a unique ID for any given certificate. So let's go over a real world example of using certificates. This is an asymmetric authentication of ink cartridges. So ink cartridges will be made by both the OEM and licensees of the OEM. So a chain of trust is used. Let's talk about how the factory provisions these ink cartridges. We start off with the OEM having a root of trust, the authority public private key. And the authority, the OEM, has a manufacturing line or it might have a licensed manufacturing line that creates these ink cartridges. That's what it's gonna make, ink cartridges. And we'll call this a disposable device. And of course, every element in a PKI system has its own public-private keys. So these ink cartridges all have their own public-private keys. So the first thing that happens, the manufacturing line sends its public key to headquarters to be signed by the authority private key creating a certificate which assures the world that this manufacturing line is a genuine manufacturing line of the OEM. Now, the manufacturing line is ready to make ink cartridges. So it asks for the device public key from the ink cartridge, signs it with its manufacturing private key, creating a certificate which it injects into the ink cartridge. Now this assures the world that this ink cartridge was manufactured on this manufacturing line. Now, once this ink cartridge gets out into the world and someone picks it up and uses it, they're gonna to wanna to know a little bit more information. That's really great that it's a genuine product of that manufacturing line, but what about that manufacturing line? Is that manufacturing line a genuine manufacturing line of the OEM? Well, of course it is, and that information also needs to be injected in the ink cartridge so that can be checked out. So that's how the ink cartridge leaves the factory. It leaves the factory with its own public private key, which is the public key is assured by the manufacturing line and the manufacturing line is assured by the authority module. Now we're in someone's home and they have a printer and they just bought an ink cartridge, which they will insert into the printer and the printer will have to authenticate that ink cartridge. Of course, all printers have knowledge of the authority public key, just as the note, if you remember in our symmetric example, all of the notebook computers had knowledge of the parent key, while every printer needs to have knowledge of the authority public key to verify the signature. The first thing that happens is we need to verify the manufacturing public key. The certificate is requested, and the signature in the certificate is verified by the authority public key. That manufacturing public key is trusted. So now we verify the device public key. So we ask for the device certificate, and we verify the signature in the device certificate with the now trusted manufacturing public key. So now we can trust the device public key. Now, if this ink cartridge is who it claims to be, 
then it should possess the device private key. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between a private key and a public key. If, if that device public key is genuine, there's only one private key that is associated with it. So what do we do? We don't ask for the private key directly, of course. We use a random number generator to send a challenge, and we ask the ink cartridge to sign that challenge with its private key and send back the signature. Then we use the now trusted device public key to verify that signature. And if it's, it verifies well, then we know that this ink cartridge is genuine. It is an OEM genuine product or a licensed genuine product. And we can start using it. Why is that authority public key inside a crypto element? I said earlier that authority public keys, or I should any public, key, is not a secret. You could you could write it on the side of your car. So why is it protected inside of a hardware insured persistent secure element? If an adversary were to change that public key, they would essentially hijack this system. And now this system would only accept ink cartridges from them, and it would no longer accept the OEM's own ink cartridge. So even though the authority public key is not a secret, Sometimes it does need security. Limited use counters. Now, in, a, in the case of ink cartridges, that's easy to figure out. You can only have so much ink. There should only be so many squirts. But in other situations, like in med some medical devices, which need to be remanufactured or sharpened or, or sterilized, it can only go through that process so many times. So you also have to have some limited use counter. So inside of all of these secure elements, there's also facilities to have a monotonic counter. This is a counter that resides inside that can only be that can only count one way. It cannot be reset. So you set a terminal count when it goes through goes through so many authentications, it can no longer do it, and it will just fault and it will no longer authenticate. Um, yeah, we have come to the end of the this overview. Uh, we can uh, now you can answer uh, ask uh, questions in the Q and A box. I noticed also, there was just some discussion about the SHA-2 algorithm and whether it was cracked, but it looks like everybody has actually answered that themselves. Uh, so yeah, that was that was not true. Um, and also there was a question about SHA-256 versus 384. Uh, those are both in the SHA-2 family. Uh, the 384 is just a 384-bit uh, key versus, uh, or I should say, not key, 384-bit length uh, versus a 256-bit length. And then SHA-3 is the successor to SHA-2. Um, yeah, that seems to cover everything that was in the uh, comments. Okay. So just to summarize here the question, then we have the... Oh, it's scrolling while I'm trying to find... Here is one. So what is the difference between SHA and AES? Okay, so SHA is a... Um, is a, a one-way uh, function that creates a, a unique uh, identifier for a file or some data. Um, and it's irreversible, uh, it's just one way. Uh, it's really meant to identify it and uh, be a, an integrity check. Whereas AES is meant to obfuscate. So what you do is you take uh, the data and you run it through, uh, it's a cipher, you run it through the cipher and it, uh, it changes it in a way where it is infeasible to understand what it is, but it's reversible. If the person on the other side receiving it has the key, uh, they can uh, enter the key into the cipher and reverse it and out comes the plain text again. So here we have another question. It's how can unlimited input set of data variable lengths be hashed one-on-one -on -one to limited number of results, fixed lengths, and be unique? It's um, that has to do with the length of um, of the of the of the output, the digest, and the strength of the algorithm. And um, in reality, um, it's not impossible, but uh, we always used in cryptography, we always use the word infeasible. Um, so it's you know, asymptotically approaches impossible. Uh, and so what you do is you simply, you know, you, you put in um, 256 bits of the uh, of the data you're, you're taking a digest of or you're hashing, and then uh, you get the result, and then you just 
hash the next 256 onto your result and you just keep overlaying it again and again and again. So uh, so order matters in a hash, uh, by the way. So when you when you mix a hash with a key and you're creating sort of a, a message authentication code, uh, it matters where you put the key. And that's a whole other uh, presentation, uh, how you properly make a um, an HMAC. Uh, but yeah, so it's uh, the answer to the question is, is you can get a um, uh, the same digest from from two different files. It's just infeasible. It's it's highly highly unlikely. And uh, actually, this is the this that's kind of the way uh, that cryptocurrencies are um, are created. Uh, that that collision is is a, is a a very unique thing, and it's it's used as the root of identity for a a coin. Okay, I didn't know that. Yep. And here an easy question uh, for me, or for Electro more or less. As I said at the beginning also, uh, so these are not slides, but this is a video, it's recorded, and it will be published on the Elector TV YouTube channel uh, afterwards, so you can watch it uh, afterwards. In yes, and if you also, I mentioned in this uh, presentation, and uh, if you watch the... Uh, the crypto primer itself. You, we mention other things like uh, we have an entire presentation on on ciphers. We go over what a cipher is. We go over um, uh, DES, triple DES, AES, Cha Cha Twenty, um, all these all these things um, in a, in a nice presentation. It tells you tells you what all the different modes are, what they mean, how they work in in nice uh, understandable block diagrams. Just ask Denu for it. Uh, or, or any of the other presentations that we have. Okay. Uh, there is a question, not in the Q&R box, but in the public box. Um, do you have some examples of implementation of crypto on microchip microcontrollers? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's... Uh, so we we, um, we we have a... If you go to our website, we have this uh, thing called the Trust Platform. Uh, this is a, uh, a tool that allows you to use our secure elements very easily uh, and also get the secure elements provisioned very easily. And you, there's a bunch of different uh, examples uh, of that. Uh, in addition, we have other, so that's, uh, that's the trust platform and, and being able to use different uh, 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 disposable uh, type of applications and uh, web-based applications, cloud-based applications, that's all in there. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, a library called Crypto Auth Lib, and we have a series of, uh, of examples in, uh, uh, in our IDE that allows you to use our, uh, our Crypto Auth Lib library very easily. And uh, it, it it comes with uh, a PowerPoint sort of follow the bouncing ball kind. It's not video, but it's it's uh, screen grabs inside PowerPoint um, that you it's it's like really follow the bouncing ball. It's, it's really hard to not follow it. Uh, and it really just holds your hand right through it. And it shows you how to set up uh, crypto auth live. It shows you how to read the serial number off of a a secure element, how to generate a random number, and just keeps growing in complexity until you're doing an entire AES GCM application. Yes, I was just looking for it. I have uh, here somewhere a, a PIC a microcontroller board and an AVR microcontroller board for uh, microchip uh, cloud applications. So you can buy these uh, easily from Farnell or anywhere. And then you can, uh, they contain, if I remember correctly, a secure element and all the software to communicate and to do communication with the cloud, et cetera, secure communication. So that's an easy way to get started with this stuff, actually. Yes. And remember, Danu is your friend. He uh, Just reach out to him and he can point you in the right direction for anything you want. Uh, we still have a few minutes. There is another question here in the public box. Is it true that DES is crackable using an FPGA? Is it feasible yes. for SHA? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, DES uh, and triple DES is also vulnerable, though a lot less vulnerable than DES. Uh, but keep in mind there, um, you know, what is what is vulnerable? L let me give you an example. If I'm a, uh, 
if I'm a general and I'm uh, sending um, encrypted commands to an artillery uh, battery to fire on a hill, and I'm using DES, and you know, people are saying, "Oh, it's it, it's uh, you know, it's vulnerable. I can crack that." Well, how long is it going to take them to crack it? By the time the enemy uh, cracks my code, I've already hit the hill. <laughs> uh, it's done them no good, right? So there's a there's a concept of you know the window of vulnerability. So the answer is is twofold: is uh, just because a cipher is vulnerable to being cracked doesn't mean the cipher is utterly useless. So sometimes you'll see a cipher that you know is uh, is vulnerable still being used. You have to look at the use case that they're using that cipher in because their use case might not be uh, susceptible to that vulnerability because it may be so quick that it doesn't matter. Okay, then we have a question about, you mentioned presentations. Uh earlier that are not in the crypto cryptography course uh, can you give the links for them or should we contact the dinu for that yeah contact dinu uh just just tell him what you uh what you're doing uh let him know what your needs are and he would he'll be able to um to get to get every anything that's relevant uh to what your needs are to you yes his uh, email he pasted his email in the chat box uh, trying to find it now so then we can paste it again. Or maybe Dino, you can paste it again in the chat box so it will be at the end. Okay, well, uh, it is five o'clock, I think. Um, yeah, th thank you, Dino. So for all your questions, technical questions and other questions about this uh, webinar from Microchip, you can contact Dino Varta at microchip.com. Um, Thank you, Dan, uh, for uh, presenting this. Thank you also for putting it together. I found it very interesting. I've learned a lot from it, actually. Thank you. Um, it's it remains a kind of kind of obscure, or I mean, a complex subject. It's not easy to understand everything. You have to. Uh, have to you know, it it's down. it's not. It's one of those things that seems complex when you first pick it up, but the more time you spend with it, the more your mind sort of flexes to it and it becomes oh yeah and it becomes a lot easier believe me it's just it like i said earlier in the presentation it's not something that we as electrical engineers pick up as a matter of course in doing the you know if you if your boss asked you to create a bluetooth radio and then uh after that project is done he asked you to make a wi-fi radio you would be able to reuse a lot of what you learned in the bluetooth radio project on the wi-fi not so with cryptography. Cryptography is kind of like its own thing. So the people who know cryptography have worked in cryptography or made an effort to learn cryptography. And that's why it seems weird um, or complex, but it really isn't. Once you once you pick it up, uh, just like if somebody never did radio, they're like, oh, radio, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, once you start working with it, it's like, oh yeah, I got this. And that's the same thing with cryptography, it's easy. Yeah, I think for me, one of the biggest eye openers was that you put authentication first. Yeah. I had still encryption in mind eh? for me. That was, um, but no, it's authentication first and then uh, you can do the rest. Yeah. I don't want a secret message from somebody I don't know who, <laughs> I don't know who yeah, they exactly. are. Exactly. It's like spam, you know, <laughs> don't want it. Okay. Well, um, we can stop here now, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, thank very for much, me. Dinu. Also, thank you everybody for being here with us. I hope it was interesting for you. And if you found so, please go to Microchip University and take the course. It will take you one and a half hours, two hours at most. And uh, you get a nice certificate that you can put on your CV and you're uh, continuing life as a uh, cryptography expert. So uh, thank you very much and um, hope to see you at our next webinar. Goodbye.